Today we are going to take the application that we built over the past two workshops and integrate some MongoDB into it. But first we're going to talk about what MongoDB is, why we are choosing to use that instead of something else, uh, how it plays nicely with Node.js, and how we can make Node.js talk to it. So to start, you should have a few things. Uh, like the past two workshops, there is a download file, a zip with a few milestone checkpoints. You should download it. You can get it from this link. It is all the way at the bottom right here uh, under these files. And if you want to follow along the slides or jump around, uh, you can also get the slides right there. Um, and then just get them opened up in a text editor like so. I just have, I just unzipped that folder and then went to project, add folder to project and added that folder. So now I have all the milestones if I ever need to jump around. And then I'm gonna start from the starting point, uh, which is the point that the last workshop finished. Um, don't worry though if you didn't attend the last workshop because most of what we're gonna do right now is gonna be like agnostic as to what we did with the last workshop. And then at the end we'll take, uh, we'll take and do something um, related, but you won't need to understand exactly all of the stuff from the last workshop to do it. So um, this is focused on the database side of things. Um, you don't need to already know Mongo, uh, but hopefully you've at least uh, gotten up to speed on Node.js a bit so you can follow along with um, the integration with Node.js. Um, and then also just make sure that you have MongoDB installed. And if you don't have MongoDB installed, you should like find a mentor right now and get that fixed. So exactly what we're gonna do, uh, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about what MongoDB is, uh, why it exists, and how to use it. We're going to uh, show how to use it with querying, inserting, uh, managing databases, collections, talk about what all of these, these terms related to MongoDB mean, and then we're going to look at how we can use MongoDB with Node.js to make it so that our application that we've been working on can store things in MongoDB and read things out of MongoDB. And then we're going to do exactly that uh, with the notes that we've been making in our note app, and then also with the Venmo payment dashboard that we added in the last workshop. And then depending on how time goes and what audience demand is, uh, if we have time left, I can just like do random stuff. So hopefully, um, as I said, you're familiar with at least the Node.js code from the end of workshop two. Um, and then there's also some more stuff added from workshop three, but most of it is kind of in a different channel from the stuff from workshop two. So if you were at either the previous workshop or the workshop yesterday afternoon, uh, you should be good to go. Just make sure that you're familiar with that code. Um, I will really quickly go over uh, the code from the end of the previous workshop just to uh, be on the same page and explain for anybody who uh, was not there uh, what, like, what's changed. So first, can I just get um, a quick background? Like, How many of you guys were at the workshop that was like an hour ago? And how many of you guys were, out of those who were not, um, raise your hand if you were not at the workshop that was an hour ago? And most of you guys were at least at the workshop yesterday or were here this morning? Yeah? Okay, cool. Um, so, let's take a look through the starting point, which is also the finishing point from last session. So, um, most of this stuff is all familiar. We have uh, view engine, template engine, uh, we store stuff in sessions. Uh, we have our notes. Um, this is going to be new to anybody who wasn't at the last workshop. We added uh, a Venmo uh, like subset of the app for doing stuff with Venmo. And then we added something to Roots for handling emails. So we can send, we can send notes as emails now. And in Venmo.js, we do a whole bunch of request stuff to authenticate with the Venmo API. and be able to send payments. And let's just look at how that works. So first, before we can run anything, we need to do npm install. And then, ah. So if you, um, if you want to run the code, Go ahead and uh, under Venmo.js, if you want to um, 
set it up so that you're authorized with your own Venmo account through a uh, Venmo application, you can go to the Venmo Developers tab. Uh, you can find information in the slides slash code from the previous workshop if you're not familiar. Um, but for now, I'm just going to put in uh, my own values so that we can test it and see that the Venmo stuff works. Um, but if you want, you could just fill this in with like a zero and just leave this as filling in from your account and all of the Venmo stuff just won't work. But you can still uh, do the other parts. So my client ID was that and... I just need to get my client secret from the Venmo API. Okay, uh, let me try rerunning that. Okay, so now we have the server running, and we have uh, as, so so far everything looks the same. We have our notes, we can click on our notes, we can look at our notes, um, we can make a new note. Uh, but one notable addition from the previous workshop is that we can now send the note in email form. So I can send this to myself. And check my email. And I just received that email of the note. Um, and then we can also go to our Venmo dashboard. Uh, I'm already authenticated as myself, and I can make a payment. Somebody give me a phone number. I'm just demonstrating that it works. Uh, we're going to add to this by keeping a history of payments later. Um, but for now, we need to demonstrate that it works. So somebody say a phone number. 626. Four zero zero eight seven six two. Okay, so I just sent some money to Sahel, and basically, what we're going to build by the end of this is uh, we're going to add to our application the ability to connect and talk to MongoDB, and then instead of storing all of those notes in a session cookie, we're going to store them in MongoDB and retrieve them from MongoDB. So that way, we're not storing all of our information in the session. We're instead storing it in a database. And then we could easily um, destroy our session and still have all of our data. Um, and then we're also going to start uh, creating a payment history of all of the Ven Venmo payments we make, and then display all of that from the database. So a bit of background on, uh, on MongoDB, um, a couple of like properties of it, and why it is that way, and, and what those all mean. Uh, the first thing to know about MongoDB is that it is schema-less. So if you're familiar with MySQL or any other SQL, um, SQL stands for Structured Query Language, uh, which implies that it has some sort of structure to it, uh, MongoDB is kind of in the opposite camp of trying not to require you to define structures. So when you're working with, with, a, with a SQL database, then you have to define a schema. You have to say, I want a table that has these properties, and I want another table that has these properties, and I'll have all of these links between them. And you have to basically tell the database exactly what your data is going to look like before you can give it any data. And MongoDB says, uh, well, that's silly. Why don't you just give me the data, and I'll just like hang on to it, and I don't really care what it looks like. Um, but if you do happen to make it consistent, then I'll index it anyway. So MongoDB is, is called schemaless in that you don't have to predefine the structure. So you could, for example, um, you could have optional fields on something. So say, um, say we're doing uh, product listings, and some products have uh, a color property, but not all products have a color property. So you don't have to define a color field in the schema. You can just tack that on there for the products that do have a color, and otherwise leave it off. Um, and then. Uh, the next part is it's called, uh, it's, it's referred to as document based, which means rather than having a row in a table, um, everything is a document within a collection. So in, in a SQL database, we call things tables and rows in tables. So each, each row in a table might correspond to um, a product that you're trying to sell or a record of a sale, something like that. In MongoDB, we call things collections, and a collection uh, so that we have databases, and then a database is composed of multiple collections, and each collection is sort of corresponds to a table in MySQL, and uh, each collection contains many documents, and each document is essentially just 
um, a JSON object. It's technically called BSON, uh, which, or, or Bison is how it's pronounced, um, which stands for binary uh, JavaScript, uh, JavaScript object notation, which is basically just a little bit of an extension of the standard JSON format that we're familiar with from JavaScript and from all the objects we've been working with in Node and from all the objects that we've been working with um, in our API calls. <coughs> so it uses a very similar data format to what we've been working with. And uh, it's just a popular replacement option for SQL. People have been getting tired of uh, SQL and all of, the, um, all of the restrictions it has on having to have a schema. Um, there are pros and cons. There are some people who think that MongoDB is like the devil and it should have never been born and that it's like a terrible thing for the world. Uh, there are other people who think it's like the greatest thing since sliced bread. So uh, whatever your opinion is, like, that's, that's like what it is and, and how it's different. Um, you can Google about it and read more, and uh, one, one thing in particular that I would recommend is uh, Googling the following. I'll write it on the board. So if I ever get boring, uh, feel free to Google this and find it on YouTube and watch it. Um, and if I do not get boring enough for you to Google that and watch it during this talk, you should watch it after this talk. Uh, it's, it's a very amusing criticism video uh, in which a person who is an, a, a rather ignorant MongoDB fanboy uh, tries to sing its praises, and somebody who uh, has a more nuanced understanding of how databases work just like completely tears them apart. So just make sure that like, you don't become the, that guy uh, in regards to MongoDB. So, um, enough on that. Uh, first thing we're going to do, we're going to not worry about Node.js for a little bit. We're just going to talk about MongoDB. We're going to get out the console. We're going to play with the database, uh, run some commands on it, and figure out kind of how querying and working with it works. So, um, if you have MongoDB, MongoDB installed, you should also have a tool called Mongo that you can run from your terminal, and that'll just give you um, a little console by which you can talk to your MongoDB. Uh, or like to your database. So it says I am connecting to test. That means that I have connected to the database called test. Um, I mentioned here we have a few commands related to the terminal, like use, show, and drop. We'll go through those. So I can do show dbs, and that shows me all of the all of the dbs that I have um, on my MongoDB server, which is running locally. So I have an admin DB, that's a default thing. And then I have code weekend, I have local, and I have autocracy, which is a side project. project. Um, so I can say use code weekend, and then I'll switch to the database code weekend. And then I can say show collections to show all of the collections, or similar to tables, that code weekend has. And we have a notes collection, and an indexes collection, and a test collection. So uh, we can say, um, we can say db.test.drop to get rid of the test collection. And then we can show collections again. And that's gone. Um, and we can do um, <coughs> we can do so we could recreate it. It will implicitly create it by inserting something into it. So next we can insert things. And then just by inserting something into the collection test, uh, which we do with db.test, so basically you access a collection with db.collection name. And then you can do commands on that collection by then doing dot whatever command you have. And commands are uh, insert, find, remove, and update are pretty much the four um, essentials. And then there are some others. Um, we won't actually talk about update, but you can Google about it. Most of, most of these things, once you understand um, the basic structure, you can just Google about how to do exact queries. And then uh, right now, we can do show collections again. And once again, we have a test collection. So let's see what's actually in that collection. Um, so we can do db.test.find. And just calling find with uh, no argument to it, will give us everything in the test collection. So 
if we go and do another insertion, and then we run find again, then we get all three of those. Now, if we want to do a query where we want only a specific, um, a specific document out of the collection, then we can essentially do a sub-document that matches what we want. So we can do, we say find all of the collection, all of the documents which match this pattern of having the hello field equal to world, and we get that one. So if we insert another one that has that, so we insert one more with the same property. If we run find on everything, we have two separate um, copies with hello equal to world. And then if we find all the ones with world, we get both of them. Now, the next thing you're probably wondering is like, what the hell is that giant like blobby string object ID thing? So in, uh, in a more traditional database, you might be familiar with the idea of a primary key, uh, which is where every single element in a table will have, will typically have um, a unique like numeric ID associated with it. Um, you know, if you ever go, uh, many websites will have just like unique IDs associated with all of the pages you might look at. Um, if you like browse like a forum, a lot of times like topics and posts will be um, assigned by ID and so on. Um, so MongoDB sort of does that, but it does it automatically with this thing called an object ID. So every time you insert something, MongoDB will automatically add an object ID for you. And this object ID uh, is sort of encoding a bit of information. So you might notice all of these start off with like the same first three quarters. Um, part of it is just some random stuff based on the system that you're running on. Part of it is encoding a timestamp. So you can actually determine what time each of these uh, each of these parts were created based only on that object ID. So it's useful. It gives you a unique ID. Um, they're guaranteed to be unique because they're based on timestamp plus the combination of other of other unique things. And you can Google and read more about exactly how you make them up. But the important part is, uh, if you ever have like an ID field of your own, you should think carefully about whether you really need it or whether you can just get away with the built-in object IDs to accomplish that. So next, uh, we can remove things. So we could do db.test.remove. And again, just like in find, where we provide a pattern that we want to kind of our, our criteria for what to find, we just provide criteria for what to remove. So if we give the same criteria, then we remove both of those. If we try to find that, we get no results. And if we find everything, then we have the two elements we had before. And as I mentioned, with everything being schemaless, we can insert things that um, we can insert things that don't necessarily follow the same structure or, or, like, or, or type, I guess, um, as everything else. And we can just do that. And one thing differs, has more stuff. You know, maybe some things don't have hello at all. Um, it, it's schemaless, so we can do whatever we want. Everything is just its own document. There's no implicit relationship between each of these separate rows, except for the fact that they're in the same collection. And then from there, uh, you can also index everything. You can, you can index by ID, so it's easy to search through things. Uh, MongoDB has a lot of the same powerful um, capabilities that a more traditional database will have, um, but it also allows you to get away without many of the like, structure requirements. So uh, again, like, for the indexing stuff, if you're looking into like, high performance stuff, feel free to like, Google around about that. But the purpose for why we're using MongoDB here is because it doesn't require us to set up a whole bunch of structure beforehand. It doesn't require um, a schema. And it's very simple to just like get in and use. It uses the same query for language for everything. We don't have to write giant SQL queries to do what we want. We don't have to learn an entire language. We just have to say, uh, here is a, a small pattern, and find me everything that matches that pattern. So any questions about uh, any of this console stuff yet? Yeah? For the object type, is it, is it like uh, we use some algorithm to hash those key into one of these items? Like um, do you mean like is it being used as like a, like a key value map or? or like a hash, like, um, like some algorithm to hash those key 
Um, well, so it's not exactly a, like a hash algorithm. Um, it's it's more so just a combination of a few different pieces of data, and then it's encoded. Um, I think in this format, it's just encoded in hexadecimal. Um, but it's made up of uh, something unique from the server that Mongo is running on, and the timestamp. And it's it's not like it's unreversible. Um, they're not like they're not like cryptographic hashes where every single one is unique and unreversible. You can like extract the data out of it. Um, I don't remember the details of that exactly off the top of my head, but MongoDB has utilities for like pulling the date out of that, for example. Um, and you could like read about that. Um, there are all kinds of details about that. Any other? Yeah. Um, are you running uh, up there straight from the command line, or how do you get um, how do you get the MongoDB set up? Yeah, so what I'm running here is, uh, is just the Mongo shell where we can interact with the database. I'm also running MongoDB itself, the, ser the database server. Um, I just have that as like a long running process on my computer. And when you install MongoDB, it'll probably tell you to like set it up like that. Um, if you don't have it running as a long, long running process, then I think you can just do something like MongoDB or MongoD. Yeah, MongoD. Um, and as long as you have uh, you know, you might not have the database path, uh, just like make it happy uh, and MongoDB can get it running. So run MongoDB in one tab and then you can run Mongo in another tab. Um, and I'm not going to try to get it running just because I already have it running and I don't want anything to like step on each other's toes. Uh, but if you're having troubles getting MongoD running, then uh, wave down a mentor and someone will help you get that fixed. <clears throat> Any other questions about like any of the commands or semantics or anything? Okay. Um, I think that's everything. So uh, now we're going to turn to Node.js. Uh, and the first thing to do to get MongoDB playing nice with Node.js is going to be installing um, the MongoDB driver, which is basically uh, a layer between which uh, Node.js talks to Mongo. So we can do npm install dot dash save MongoDB as here. And then let's go ahead and just make our own entire uh, Node, like Node.js file to just test that we're able to talk to it. So, so uh, I guess this slide is not in the perfect position, but I guess I'll cover it anyway. Um, so a bit of background on why people, uh, more so than just people like MongoDB, but people particularly like MongoDB when paired with Node.js. Uh, that's because, as I mentioned a bit earlier, um, like if we look at if we look at these objects, you'll notice that we could take this and parse it as JSON, which is the, the encoding format and an object format that JavaScript uses, and it would be completely valid. Uh, they're almost exactly the same data format for, for most of our purposes. Um, there are a few differences with Mongo, but, but most of the time you query something out of MongoDB and it just is immediately an object in JavaScript and you create an, an object in JavaScript and you give it to MongoDB and it stores it. And you don't have to do any kind of like conversion or write any sort of like layer to take your object from maybe Python and turn it into a JSON object or uh, anything where with, with MySQL you'd have to take your, your actual object in your program and break it down into all the fields in your database. You don't have to worry about any of that. You just give it the JSON object and it stores it. So that's why people really like the pairing uh, between JavaScript or any JavaScript-based system, uh, Node.js in particular, and MongoDB. And then we are right now are going to use the raw MongoDB driver, which lets us just do queries very similar to what we did in the console, where we just do uh, db.collection dot whatever command we want to run. Uh, there are also other systems. One of, one of the other interfaces that's very popular is called Mongoose. Mongoose is um, an object relational mapper, or uh, in, I guess the R is incorrect. When we're talking about MongoDB, we call it an object document model. But basically, Mongoose uh, lets you uh, optionally specify schemas if you like, and then add like functions to your objects. 
um, kind of in like an object model where you can have like JavaScript classes representing each of the collections that you have in your database. So if you're building something more heavyweight and doing individual queries all the time just isn't cutting it, and you want to have a bit of structure, then Mongoose can uh, help you get that structure. But we're not going to use that right now because there are a few uh, ideas behind Mongoose that just aren't worth covering in this context. So um, basics after we have after we have Mongo installed, I put some stuff on the slide. It's kind of small. I'll make it bigger. So. Uh, assuming that we've already done uh, Mongo equals require MongoDB, then we can get a, the database object for interfacing with the database from Mongo.db, and we can get a server from Mongo.server, and then we just have to instantiate a database and connect it to a server, and then open up that database. And after that, we can start doing queries. So uh, feel free to take this code, I'll take this code, and put it in our test file. First, we just need to do require the MongoDB module that we just did, that we just got from npm install. And then we get the database object off of Mongo, we get the server object off of Mongo, and this is all just like specifics of the wrapper for MongoDB with Node.js. Uh, you could read the docs, or you could just take this and say, okay, this is how it works. Um, and then we can connect to the database. So first we have to give it the database name that we're gonna use. So here, so here I'm using the database Code Weekend. If you notice, uh, here I give it the name Code Weekend. Uh, that's one of the databases we already have. I could give it the database test and we could read the things out of test. Let's do that for now just to see what, what's there. Actually, we'll look at the collection test. And then um, the server is localhost, is the, the machine that you're running. The port 27017 is just like a MongoDB thing. Uh, there are uh, other services have their own default port. MongoDB's default port is 27017. Um, I know, for example, like I think like Redis is like 6893, uh, SSH is typically um, 22, and so on. So. We just connect to it. Uh, these are just like some boilerplate parameters that MongoDB is happy when you give it. And then we can call db.open. So when we call db.open, uh, what we're really doing is we're calling open and then we're waiting for open to finish. Um, if you recall from the last talk, I talked about the asynchronous model of Node.js where um, whenever you do something that involves input output, such as reading or writing from a database, or anything where you have to wait for something to finish and then come back to you. Um, this function, db.open, will return immediately and then this function uh, will be invoked once the connection is actually open. So right now, um, as we're doing it this way, um, we're gonna call this open and then we're going to go straight on and call this, this collection.find uh, right away without actually waiting for anything to open. So uh, I sort of use this trick in the context of the, um, of the Node.js app, and we get away with it because when we first start up the app, immediately after we start the server, uh, we, have a, we have a second to connect before anybody's gonna be sending us requests. So uh, it's, it's kind of violating the model of Node.js, but we get away with it, and I'll explain that more later. But for right now, we need to wrap our collection in uh, our collection query inside of the open call. So this is a function that won't execute until, um, until the DB has been opened and we have a connection to it. Is anybody like completely lost about this idea of the function thing? No, okay. Um, so we do collection, we can go to the test collection, or we could go to any other collection, we could go to the, let's see. What other collections do we have? Notes. So we can see all of our notes that we have. And once again, uh, following the, the asynchronous I.O. model, um, when we want to query MongoDB, 
we use find. Uh, the two array is just a thing specific to um, turn the result into an array that we can work with. And then we provided a function that it calls once it's done. So when we call db.collection, you know, we, we couldn't do something like We couldn't do something like this. Uh, the, the return value of db.collection notes.find.toArray, um, it doesn't really have a return value. What it does instead is it runs and it returns immediately and it just w has us give it a function and it calls that function with the value once the value is back. And that way um, our server can go on and deal with other things while we're waiting on MongoDB to get us the query back. Um, so if we instead followed a, model, a synchronous model where we do set notes equal to the return value, then in most, in most, um, in most other frameworks that, that would follow that flow, then the whole system, the whole server would be waiting for that query to come back before it goes on and does anything else. And the whole server with everybody that might be uh, trying to make a page request will just wait on that one database qu query. So this is, this is one of the ways that Node.js in particular, for many applications where everything is bound by waiting around for databases and waiting around for network requests, uh, manages to be very fast because it can, it can, you know, while I'm waiting for the query to come back, I can go and handle a whole bunch of other people's requests. But the, the downside of that is that we have to structure all of our code with these functions that get called once things come back. We can't just like have values that come back. Question? Uh, so you're suggesting if we do like yeah. So you're saying what happens if we do this? Yeah. Uh, then what's going to happen, uh, you know, in theory, is we're going to call this db.collection. Uh, find and we're going to try to find things and that query is going to go off and then maybe this this remove query uh, we're going to immediately go and call that also before possibly before um, our function comes back with our array of notes and uh, wouldn't wouldn't that potentially like mess with the results well everything is still going to execute uh, as in terms of the callbacks everything is gets queued up in sort of a, a queue that all the all of the um, callbacks <laughs> are waiting for where we're not actually going to do the remove until after the find is done. Um, it's not like things just like randomly get mixed in their order. It's just that um, there is kind of an event loop going on. And you get, you, whenever we do something asynchronous, we kind of queue up something for the event loop to handle. And there's still order maintained, but we can't just immediately get the result. We have to wait um, for the event loop to go in a circle to get the result. You can, um, this is sort of related to the um, like the, the structure of Node.js or the, the architecture of Node.js's model. Um, you can uh, a good thing to Google to understand more about this would be the Node.js event loop. So feel free to read up on that, and you would you would learn more about how you know even though it seems like maybe the second thing might finish because we call the second thing before the first thing necessarily finishes. Um, we, we do have a guarantee that the first, the, the first callback is going to come out before the second callback comes back. So, um, so we open our connection to the database and then we find all the notes and we log them. So let's just run this file. And we get two notes, uh, which are notes that I've made previously um, with, uh, with the final form of the app that we're going to finish today. So later on, we could just like add um, notes through the web page and then run this, and we'd see them here. But basically, we've, we've gotten notes to talk to the database. We can also just talk straight to the database through the console. So we could do. We can do that and we get basically the same thing. So if we take this uh, MongoDB connection code with us and we go back to our application, let 
then we want to connect to MongoDB. We can do that here. Move our Mongo require up to the top though. So we're gonna go ahead and require the MongoDB driver right here. And then we'll come down here and we will get our database and our server uh, objects off of the Mongo driver. And then we instantiate a new database, Code Weekend, which is the one we're working with. And then we tell it to connect to our server. And then this is where uh, sort of a, a hacky part comes in. So now we just call db.open and we give it a function that it's going to call when it gets done. Uh, we, could, we could theoretically say, we could do that. And you might think, well, what if I want to do a query right here? Uh, then that would potentially not work because I'm going to, uh, I'm going to try to try to open it and then I'm going to try to do a query, but my connection's not going to be there yet. So my query is going to fail because I can't, I can't do a query before I have my connection. Uh, but we managed to get away with this because the way that Node.js web app works, which is what we're doing, um, we're going to start up the server and it's going to make the connection and hopefully, uh, at least in the context of our hackathon app where we can get away with things like this, uh, we're not going to receive any requests in the small window between when we start the server and when we actually finish our connection. So after we finish the connection, then we can, we'll be just fine uh, doing db dot whatever we need to do. So uh, you, this, uh, I'm, I'm only doing this hack because uh, not doing this would require a lot more in the way of code patterns and stuff that is unrelated to uh, making a working database app. Um, if you wanted to learn more about code structure, you could read about Node.js patterns and using MongoDB with Node.js and all kinds of stuff. But um, for the sake of not spending half of this workshop talking about uh, callbacks and asynchronous stuff, I'm just doing this and it'll work because uh, because each request processes separately. And by the time we process any request, we should theoretically have this connection finished. Um, so the only thing left we have to do is, we have this database object right here, but we need this database object to be accessible for all of our request handlers. So we have all of these request handlers over here in routes.js for the main page, for the notes page, for all of our pages. But we're loading our database here. So how can we uh, make our database accessible to all of our handlers? So uh, one of the main things that we do with Express is we want to just put everything on our request object. So we've, uh, we've used middlewares before that create request.session. We've had middlewares before that give us, um, give us request.body. Um, we've had middlewares give us, um, over in the Venmo, we've had rec.query, rec.query right here. So it's a pretty common pattern with Express to whenever you need something to be accessible to all of your request handlers, you just like tack it onto the request object. So we'll do the same thing here. And in our middleware here, where we're passing our messages and uh, making sure our notes exist, we can just also say, uh, request.db equals db. And I think that should do it. And then from there, we could create a new route to actually get stuff out of the database. So say we do We make a new handler at the path db test, and at db test, we just want to do a simple query. So we can do db.rec.db. Um, collection notes dot find dot two array, as we did before, and we give it the function which uh, which will be called once MongoDB comes back to us with the results of our query.
So we have an anonymous function here, and once the MongoDB gets our notes back, then it'll call this, and then inside of this block here, then we have access to the notes. And we could just do So we can just say, just like dump the notes out, and let's try running that. So as you can see, like it, it prints out connected to database almost immediately after we start. So um, as long as our server is not like getting bombarded right when we start up, uh, the sort of workaround that we're using uh, should be should be just fine. So we can go to DB test. And from dbtest, we get those two notes that we have in the database, just as we did before. Except now we're outputting them as the results of a page request through our server. So now, uh, theoretically from here, we can go around and modify all of our request handlers to do things with the database, because they all have access to it now through request.db. So we can use request.db collection, whatever, and then we can do find, we can do insert, we can do remove. Um, so now we have everything we need to go through and start storing all of our notes in the database instead of storing them in the session. And uh, if you're following along those slides, we are currently, um, we are currently progressing onto milestone two. So, one of the first things we can do is just look everywhere that we use um, request.session.notes, we can try to refactor it to use the database instead. So our goal here is uh, we have request.session.notes, which we use here, or sorry, which we use here. We use it here, and we have some logic dealing with it here, and we just want to get rid of all of that and just deal everything with storing the notes should be tied to the database. So we can go through and do that. So if we want to get a single note, then uh, we're going to go ahead and replace the ID of each note with the object ID from the MongoDB uh, document. And then we can just say the note is um, going to be the note that we get from a query. So we can do, if we wrap our return here in a query much like this, um, we're going to make it so that when we view a note, we're pulling it out of the database instead. So instead of doing dot find, we can do, um, we can do find one, and find one will return us just a single object. Um, so find one is a special, special method in Mongo. Uh, I can demonstrate that in the shell. We can do, so I can do db.notes.find one. And if I gave it uh, an, an ID here, I copy and paste that. Uh, then we get the one. So uh, find one lets us just provide an explicit object ID and it'll return us just that object out of the collection with that ID. So again, we can come back here and we can use find one and we can just say the underscore ID is um, So we're going to have to import the object ID function from Mongo, which we can do in just a moment. Oh, whoops. I'm editing the wrong part. So here, so we have node ID. Um, and instead of setting node ID equals uh, this number, we can come down here and we can use find one. 
and we can say uh, find the note which has the underscore ID equal to the object ID uh, instantiation of node ID. So basically, node ID is going to be a string representation of MongoDB's special object ID thing, and we can parse it and process it as, into an object ID by just calling this object ID function, which we need to get. So we can say, So we can import that from the MongoDB driver like that. Um, so now we have this object ID function that'll turn any string representation of an object ID into an actual object ID for us to compare. So now, uh, instead, of, instead of pulling the node off of the session, we just pull it off of the database, and then we return that node. So now, if we restart the server, we can go to slash uh, one of these object IDs. So now if I go to this URL, uh, oops. Ah. Let's just comment out this uh, fail case for a moment. Uh, hmm. I expected that to work. Let's investigate. I'm going to cheat and look at my milestone too, where I already coded this up, and it's probably going to be some tiny little difference. Um, oh, it's because I had already casted the node ID to a number here. So when doing it from a number, it may not work the same because when we cast a hexadecimal representation to a number, then it's going to uh, turn that into like a decimal number. So that's what was wrong. So if we restart that and we revisit this page, then we get our node out of the database. And if we go and insert a new node in the database <laughs> using the shell, not even using our Node.js app, but using just the database, And then we find its ID. So we get that object, and we can see that note. Oops, I need to restart the server. And we can see that. So we inserted that through the console, but we can still get it from our app. So because our app is getting everything out of the database. So. Um, Next up, we are successfully pulling our notes out of the database. The next two things that we need to do are, uh, one, we need to get the list of all of the notes we have for our index page right here. Um, this is the list of all of the notes that we have in the session storage. So we need to instead get a list of all of the notes we have from MongoDB in that, pit, in that spot. And we also need to make it so that when we make a new note, we store it in MongoDB instead of just storing it in the session. So let's do the first one first and the second one second. So under the slash route, right now we're just grabbing request.session.notes as our notes. Um, instead, we need to do a database query. So we can do a database query just like we do in the other method. We find all of our notes, we turn it into an array, and we get the notes. And then we can just return those notes here. So we just need to wrap all of the return stuff that we had that was getting the session notes 
uh, inside of a database query, and in that callback, we'll get our notes from the query, and then we'll return that. And we start the app. And now our list is of those. Uh, one important difference, though, that we're going to have to make to our template is uh, ID versus underscore ID. So uh, before, when we created notes, uh, as you can see here, line, line 44, uh, we set a field called ID, and we're using that ID field to create our hyperlink. We need to instead use the underscore ID field. So we just need to modify our template for that a little bit. So here, uh, line 15, we use uh, ID and then the title. Uh, instead, we can just use underscore ID. And that way, we can just use the object ID that MongoDB generates automatically for us and use that uh, as our identifier to uh, figure out which note to pull out of the database. So now we get all of these links here. And we can click on one of them, and we can see that note. So the last thing to do is to make it so that when we create a note, instead of adding it to the session, we add it to the database instead. So right now, uh, we're just doing uh, session.notes.push, and then we give it this object. Instead, we can just pass that to, um, to an insert command. So we can start from our, our friend here, change the find to insert. Okay, so now, um, here in this first gap, we have the object that we're trying to insert, so we can provide the title and the body like we do below, and in the second part, we have the callback that happens after the insertion is completed. So we can move, we can move our message and our redirect into the second part, and we can move our object into the first part. And we can just get rid of all of this where we push it onto the session notes. And we can do our message and send our redirect after the callback comes back. Um, so there are a lot of um, like error checking steps where we have potential for an error if the database server is offline or if for whatever reason, maybe uh, the database has a space limit and we run into the space limit um, where we potentially end up with an error and I'm ignoring those right now just for the sake of not writing up a bunch of error checking boilerplate. But um, in general, whenever you have a callback, if there's an error possibility for the callback, which most callbacks have, um, you should do some sort of check and uh, do some logic to deal with the error. And at the end, if we really want to do that, we can do that, but uh, just be aware for hackathons, where you're generally only demoing the working case, uh, where everything goes exactly as you expect it to, you can get away without it. But in, in more robust uh, applications, you definitely want to be checking for these errors and thinking about what could happen and how to handle it. So here we go. Let's restart the server. And let's try making a new note. So we make that note, and now our list has another entry, and it did go in the database. And we can verify that uh, by going to the console. <coughs> and we can see in the database. Okay, so any questions about that? So we just migrated the backend storage of the notes uh, from away from the sessions to the database. Uh, the functionality didn't really change, but the good part is that now, if I go to my, to my browser and I open up an incognito window where my session is gone, then if I also restart the server. So my session is gone, but my notes are still there. So I don't need the session to keep track of the notes anymore. But before, if I, if I did this before, uh, 
it would have had no notes because it would have been an empty session because of the uh, the new browser browser um, session. Any questions? Okay. Um, so back to the slides. Uh, we just finished milestone two, except for one little cleanup we can do. So since we never even use request.session.notes anymore, we can get rid of this part where we ensure that it exists in our middleware. Um, but otherwise, okay, so at that point, we're done with milestone two, and the next thing to do is keep a payment history with Venmo. So this is where things will get more exciting. Uh, I, will, I will be Venmoing people pennies in order to test that everything works. Um, and hopefully we'll end up with a payment history. So to go back and show the Venmo dashboard. So we have this dashboard. Um, I'm authenticated and I can make payments. And I would really like to be able to see all of the payments that I've made uh, right here in this nice little gap. So we can just follow a very similar model to what we just did for storing the notes in the database. We can just, every time we create a payment, um, we have, we have a, a post processor, like a, a form processor, um, much like this, this create processor that we have here. We have a processor for slash pay under the Venmo module, uh, or so, slash send under the Venmo module right here. And we can just hook into this and change the logic around a little bit, and instead of storing, in, instead of uh, getting the result and just not doing anything and redirecting, uh, we can add in a step where we store it in the database somewhere, and then we can just add to our uh, dashboard view method here a query to get that history out and to display it in the template. So first, let's go ahead and do, um, Let's borrow uh, the example where we insert into the notes and modify that to do what we want. So instead of calling it notes, let's use the collection payments. So just like that, we can just start using the collection payments. We don't have to go and create it beforehand. We can just start inserting things into it, and MongoDB will take care of the rest. So we can say um, it had an amount and it had a phone, and it had a note, and it had a recipient, and maybe it had a time or a date. And once again, we can just move the redirect logic into the callback function. And we'll figure out the recipient a little bit ahead of time. Okay, so um, all of this stuff doing this request uh, with the phone and the amount and the note and the access token and all of this JSON parsing and all of that, um, that's all just stuff specific to the Venmo, to the Venmo API. Um, if you don't, uh, if you don't like, if you didn't go to the previous workshop, uh, don't worry about it. You, you don't need to understand how that works to understand the database stuff. But what you do need, do need to know is that uh, from this dashboard, when I fill out this form and hit submit, then it posts it to this slash send endpoint, and this is the code that handles it. And uh, once this request goes to Venmo, we send a request to Venmo to say, hey, can we make this payment? And Venmo comes back and says, okay, you made the payment, the recipient was so-and-so, uh, here are the details, here is when it happened, and all of that. So uh, all that we need to understand is that we're getting the results of this payment back, and we want to just store um, the information about it in the database. So first, um, I'm just going to do a small refactor. So we're using rec, uh, request.body.amount.phone.note a lot. So I'm just going to make uh, some easier to use variables for those. So we have all of that. And then we can do just phone mount. And note. And we can do the same down here. So we can just use amount, phone, note, uh, the recipient. So uh, from, from this response that we got, the, the body that 
Venmo gives us back, it has a whole bunch of information. Um, it has uh, a payment, and that payment has a target, which is the, the person that we gave it to, and that target has a user, which gives you all the information about the user, and display name is a field on one of Venmo's user objects that tells us the first and last name of the person. So, uh, so we'll be able to keep track of like who we sent the money to by recording that recipient. And then for date, we can just use date.now. That's just a JavaScript thing that tells us uh, the current uh, Unix timestamp down to milliseconds. So we can keep track of that, and then uh, we can go out and create a nice history saying, uh, you paid so-and-so this many dollars uh, on this date. And get a nice little list of all the payments we've made. So, let's restart the server and test that the insertion is working. So. Uh, somebody give me a phone number. We can check that it ends up in the database so that we can pull it out for history. Anybody? It's a free penny. Just say your phone number. Uh, 267. Don't all do it at once. 267. 267. 408. 408. 6612. 6612. Two. Okay, so I successfully sent a penny to you, and let's check if that ended up in the database. And if we find our payments, then uh, we see that we have this history where we sent a payment of one penny to the phone number, and here we have a timestamp of when we did it. And now we can just pull that out and display that on the Venmo page to see all the payments we've sent. So let's start working on that part now. So right now, um, our dashboard display is just saying, uh, pull the Venmo information off of the session. So we're storing the information about the user who has authenticated Venmo for making payments um, on the session. And we just pull that off and we hand it to the template. So we're gonna want to move things around a little bit, uh, maybe have a Venmo user and a Venmo payments. <coughs> and that payments will be what we get from the database. And we'll change this thing's name to user. Um, false is the letter value there. Okay, so we have a Venmo user. We're gonna have to tweak our, tweak our template a little bit to find the values off of Venmo user instead of off of Venmo. And then we'll have to add to our template to display the payments that we give it. And the last thing we need to do is do a database query to get a value to pass for that Venmo payments. So we can do db.collection uh, payments dot find. And then turn it into an array. And then inside of this context, we have the payments returned from the database query right there. And so we can just move this return into here to have access to those payments. And now we just need to update our Venmo template file to show those payments. So let's change everything where we use Venmo to Venmo user instead. And now uh, if we're authenticated, then let's just show our list of payments right here. So we can do that as an un unordered list, uh, much like we do in the main spot where we show a list of all of our notes. Uh, we'll, we'll borrow from this a bit. So we can we can just copy paste edit as necessary, and here
Okay, so now we'll show payment history and then we'll show a list. And if we have any payments, then we'll, we'll show a list entry for each of those. And if we don't, we'll just say that you don't have any payments yet. And we'll only show this if we have a Venmo user. So if we don't have a Venmo user, which means that uh, the person using the web page is not authorized Venmo, uh, which is what happens uh, if you like start a new session and haven't authorized it yet, then we just won't show any. We won't try to query the database for uh, payments that don't exist. So, um, so right now we're just going to show uh, this, this dot notation. This is a special mustache thing for just showing uh, the value of that thing from the list. So this, this block right here is basically just a for loop that says for each of the things in the Venmo payments list, uh, just, just output that, that uh, element. And each of those elements is actually an object with um, all of those fields that we saw, um, amount, phone, uh, recipient, etc. So this is just going to show us like a blob. We're going to have to go through and format it a little bit nicer, but for now, let's just check that it works. And I forgot to put rec before .db. There we go. Okay, so uh, in fact, it's so much an object that it doesn't even want to show us as JSON, but we can get um, some stuff off of it. So we could do um, so under this scope where we're iterating over a list of things, uh, we can just we don't have to do like Venmo payment dot whatever. We can just do the name of the field on that object. So we can do paid a uh, dollar amount to the recipient and. Then we can do the date. And let's see how that looks. So right now our date is just a timestamp. We can format that nicer. Um, but we, ha we know that we paid a penny. So let's format that date a little bit nicer. We can just do a for each on the payments. So uh, here, before we pass the payments uh, from the database to the template rendering, we can just take a pass over each payment and we can just add like a nice formatted date to each payment. So we could do, because the date when it gets stored in MongoDB is no longer a JavaScript date object, so it's not going to look nice. Um, but if we do that, and then we change it to formatted date here, And then restart. Then we can get a full timestamp. And we could, we could take that date and format it however we like. Uh, but for now, we can see that, that I have Venmoed uh, one person a penny. And that was, um, well, apparently, the timestamps are goofy in some way, because it was definitely not 30 seconds ago that I sent that. But, uh, we have a record of it. Hmm. Okay, so anyway, let's uh, check that this list works for more than just one thing. So, um, do people want to keep volunteering phone numbers or should I just get, get my phone out and, and pull some contacts? Free penny, anybody? 609-845-5096. Okay, so I paid Karan uh, a penny and, oh, look what our problem is. Uh, the date is the same for all of them. So something's wrong here where I'm doing payment.date. So let's figure out what payment.date is and if that's even working. Semicolon. Uh, so semicolons in JavaScript are not necessary. Um, they're optional. They're a good habit. Uh, most style guides will tell you that you should have semicolons all the time. 
uh, but there are only like four code patterns where you actually need them to be unambiguous. Um, and if you forget one for a moment, it's not a big deal because you can use a tool like ESLint, which I've also given an entire talk on, to catch all the spots where you forgot semicolons, and then you can go back and fix that. Um, but they don't actually matter most of the time in JavaScript. Okay, so we console log those two dates. So those dates are different, but... Oh, I know what's wrong. Okay, so I'm trying to do a new date, but I forgot the new keyword. That'll, that'll get you. So now, there we go. There we get the dates that we want. So I was passing a timestamp to the date, but I wasn't invoking it as a new date. So it was just defaulting to the current time. And now we have a history, and uh, what the hell, I'll send a penny to one more person just to complete the history. Anybody? Two six seven. Two six seven. Four three eight. Four three eight. One three eight. One three five eight. Okay, and uh, we successfully got your name off of uh, the Venmo payment results and stored that. So uh, here we have a history, and that's all in the database, as we said. Um, the one caveat here is that. If I deauthorize Venmo here, and then somebody else comes in and tries to use this to send payments, uh, which it's perfectly capable of doing, um, it's going to show all the payment history at the level of the application, not at the level of the user. So uh, one extension that we could possibly do is um, add, uh, like, tagging each of these payments by who sent it. Uh, but really, the only thing that we, piece of information we have for who sent it is the access token. And we don't want to tag it by the access token because the access token is like the secret password that we have that lets us actually send the payment. And if that gets leaked, then that's bad news. Um, so un understanding that this is not uh, robust, but for the purposes of our hackathon demo, where we are not going to demonstrate multiple people trying to use it, uh, it works just fine. So that is a possible like extension where we could uh, we could add like user login we could make uh, we could let people sign up for accounts and then log in and then we could just tag these payments by the login name of the person and then we could just add that as a query field um, to separate all of those uh, but in this case um, that's not like strictly in the context of a talk about databases that would be more of a talk on login and, and authentication but just like understand that um, we don't have good separation of data in that way and that would be something that uh, could be fixed. So any questions about all of this? Yeah? Um, what is the new change to date? Yeah, so, um, so date normally is a function, um, is, is an object itself. And when you invoke it as a function, it'll just take any argument and give you uh, the current time. Um, but date is also a class. And when you do new date, it does the constructor, and the constructor can take an argument for the time that you want the date to represent. Um, it's just semantics of JavaScript. You could Google about JavaScript's date class and learn more. Um, but basically, I wasn't instantiating it as a class. I was instead just calling a function that gives you the current time. And adding new makes me instantiate it as a class instead. Any other questions? Okay, let's just go watch MongoDB as web scale. We have found MySQL to be an excellent database. Um, can you guys, is that somewhat audible? Um, is, there, is there an audio system here? Huh? Does it work? Yeah. How do I make it work? Should I plug this in? database from our website. Okay, so I will I will leave Any you guys with this. Yes, I have a question. Why didn't you use MongoDB? MongoDB is a web scale database and doesn't use SQL or joins so it's high performance. That's an excellent question. We evaluated several no SQL databases and concluded that the options are still too immature for our production needs. 
MySQL as a proven database that is used across the web and has the features we need. But it doesn't scale. Everybody knows that relational databases don't scale because they use joints and write to disk. Scalability is a complicated topic and it's hard to make a general statement like that. Relational databases weren't built for web scale. Mongo <laughs> even handles web scale. So you can turn it on and it scales right up. It may surprise you that there are a handful of high profile websites still using relational databases and in particular MySQL. Relational databases have evidence mismatch. I think you mean impedance. <laughs> MySQL is slow as a dog. MongoDB will run circles around MySQL because MongoDB is web scale. <laughs> MongoDB does have some impressive benchmarks, but they do some interesting things to get those numbers. For example, when you write to MongoDB, you don't actually write anything. You stage your data to be written at a later time. If there's a problem writing your data, you're fucked. <laughs> it like a good design to you. If that's what they need to do to get those kid-ass benchmarks, then it's a great design. <laughs> if you're stupid enough to totally ignore your ability just to get benchmarks, I suggest you pipe your data to DevNull. It will be very fast. If DevNull is fast in web scale, I will use it. Is it web scale? You. <laughs> okay, so for those who don't, uh, who are not as, as Unix uh, knowledgeable as, as others, uh, what he's referring to is, which is a special place on Unix-based operating systems like Linux or Macs, uh, where when you have a stream of data and you don't care about it at all and you want it to get deleted or just like to disappear, uh, you send it there. And it basically just like wipes it from memory. So uh, that, that's the joke. You are kidding me, right? I was making a joke. I mean, if you're happy writing to a database that doesn't give you any idea that your data is actually written just because you want high performance numbers, why not write to DevNull? It's fast as hell. Does DevNull support sharding? Holy shit. For my own health, I'm going to assume you're just messing with me and are actually retarded. Do you even know what a shard is? Charts are the secret ingredient in the web scale sauce. <laughs> Please tell me you don't actually make a living in a technology field. I'm a web programmer. <laughs> as a result, I officially resigned from my job as software engineer and will take up work on a farm shoveling pig shit and administering data suppositories to sick horses because it will be a thousand times more tolerable than being in the same industry as dipshits like you. Let us post on highscalability.com and think you're a fucking Google architect and parrot slogans like web scale and charting, but you have no idea what the fuck you are talking about. You're going to blow some project to hell because you get a woody playing with software like it's a six doll. Relational databases have been around since the fucking 70s and are some of the most mature technology you can find. Yet somehow everything needs to be reinvented because Google and Amazon post some white papers. If you need to build a globally distributed search engine that manages petabytes of data, fine, build your own database. But if you're like 99.9% .9 of companies, you can probably get by very well with something like MySQL and maybe Memcache. Read this will kick Mem catches us. It's so fast and scalable. Right now I'm thinking of how much fun it will be to castrate my first bull down on the farm. I cannot wait to cut off the testicles of a 3,000 pound raging bull as it tries to kick my head in. MongoDB is a document database that doesn't need noise. It uses MapReduce. Now I'm feeding a cistern of chicken shit, but I don't care because I don't have to listen to the no SQL fanboy is reciting a feature list of their favorite schema free database. By writing to every map files, MongoDB can improve its right throughput by a factor of 10. What the fuck? Let's <laughs> abandon transactions, consistency, durability, and pin our mission critical data to a table and give it a night it will never forget. I mean, who cares what we store as long as we do it quickly? Oh, sorry. That's right. I'm on the farm now suffocating from the stench of a thousand cow farts. But it smells like roses to me, because I am nowhere near this moron in conversation. MongoDB uses atomic modifiers for contention-free performance. Now I've contracted more RJ to call from cleaning cow stalls and then bleeding out my asshole. <laughs> I'll be dead soon. 
but that is a welcome relief. I will never have to witness the collapse of the world economy because no SQL radicals talk financial institutions into abandoning perfectly good data stores because they didn't support distributed fucking MapReduce. MongoDB stores files of any size without complicating your stack. <laughs> Thank you for your questions. This presentation is over and I'm fucking off to the farm to start my new career. Okay, so uh, the lesson from that, MongoDB is different. Uh, it's not necessarily better. There are trade-offs. Some of the criticisms of MongoDB from here uh, have been somewhat addressed. This video is a few years old. Um, but like, it is impossible to say that one software solution is simply better than another software solution. And MongoDB is just an option, and there are lots of other options. Uh, so just like, don't be that fanboy of anything. Um, we just chose MongoDB because it's really easy and it works with Node.js really well and I do not otherwise endorse it. Um, so yeah, uh, that's that. Good luck next weekend with pen apps. Uh, I assume you're all participating since you're here. Um, and if you guys have any questions, we'll all be around. Uh, if you have questions about the database stuff or anything really, we'll be here. Good luck.